Good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to our beautiful talk today, Touching the Divine Through Embodied Consent with uh, Robin Dalton. I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, I've known Robin for uh, now three years, I think. And we met at a beautiful retreat in Bali where I was doing a uh, training where the whole topic of consent was uh, a core foundation of what we were doing. So for those of you that don't know Robin or uh, maybe, you know, I've read a bio but forgot a little bit about it. I just want to read this bio so you get acquainted with uh, our speaker tonight. So Robin is an international intimacy coach and a consent facilitator. And he's passionate about helping people find what brings them joy in their body and in their life. Our work is at the intersection of mindfulness, consent, embodiment, and sexuality. Guiding people to slow down and bring awareness to what they desire, practice the skills to communicate those desires, and create clear agreements to receive exactly what they want. She's a co-founder of the School of Consent with Dr. Betty Martin, the creator of the Wheel of Consent. And she has certification as a transformational leadership coach, Wheel of Consent facilitator, and tension and trauma release exercise, TRE, provider. And she's completing a training as a sexological body worker. She's also a collaborator and coach with self cervix And she has worked with hundreds of clients and presented thousands of individuals at Tantra and sexuality festivals in Europe and in Australia. Welcome. Thank you so much. So good to be here with all of you. Yeah, it's such a, such a pleasure. So I'm going to dive right in because we call this talk. Okay, uh, let's do it. <laughs> you choose the, the topic today, <laughs> Touching the Divine Through Embodied Consent. And well, you know, there's many words here, but there's one that feels very key and that this word consent. So you're the co-founder of the School of Consent with Betty. <laughs> And Betty Martin, for those of you that don't know her, you can check her work and the Wheel of Consent, but I'm going to ask you your definition of consent. What is consent? Oh, that's a great question. And it's interesting to hear you say the most important word in that is consent. And I would say that embodied consent, mm -hmm. the two of those together are really important. And so, you know, oftentimes people think of consent and define consent as permission or synonymous with permission. So if I say, you know, I, I need someone's consent, I'm talking about, I need someone's permission to do something that I want. And in the work that I've been doing with consent, we're, we're working with a broader definition. And that is that consent is an agreement between two or more people about what may happen between us or what will not happen between us. And so it goes beyond permission and it's really about the communication and the agreement that we come to and arrive at together. And it is ongoing. So we don't just get consent and then we go off and we start doing something and we're stuck because we've both agreed and any given moment we're watching and we're noticing our own body our own experience and in any given moment a yes can turn into a maybe or a no and so it's really about not just the words that we're using to create consent but it's bringing our whole body to the conversation and staying attuned to what's happening in our body in any given moment and noticing when we've had enough, when we're full, when we feel complete 
when we change our mind and decide actually this isn't what I want anymore, or when we decide I'm actually now a no. And having the ability to speak up and to state that and to change the agreement. Mm. You know, it reminds me, it brought me directly back to an exercise I think we did together or something very similar uh, in that training where it was about giving a hug or receiving a hug. And someone comes to me and say, can I give you a hug? You know, and I was like, sure. <laughs> and the person gives me a hug. And that was pretty much the agreement. Yes, you can give me a hug. And I'm okay with that. But then the hug went for a long time. Maybe it was not that long, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, maybe a minute. And then I started feeling not very comfortable. I was like, well, I'm kind of done with this hug right now. <laughs> you know, and I realized, well, we didn't really agree on how long was going to be the hug or how tight it was going to be or where you were going to touch me. And I realized like so many things that even in something that basic, you know, can really show us that maybe most of my agreements are not very clear. In fact, there's no agreement. I'm just saying a yes. And I assume that the other person kind of know what I want or how long I want it. So is that common, like this part of the, of the consent work? Is that pretty much the, the heart of it? Well, I guess I would ask a question of the group. Have you ever been in a situation where suddenly something was happening and you weren't sure who it was for and if you wanted to even be involved in it? Anybody had that experience? Mm. I'm seeing some hands going up. This is quite common. And even in what the question that you phrased, may I give you a hug? There's a muddiness in that question, which can lead to confusion about one of the most important questions we need to be able to answer when it comes to consent. And that is the question of who is it for? So who is doing the action and who is it for? And if you can't answer that question of who is it for, then it's, it's most likely going to turn into this feeling of, I actually, I'm not really sure what's happening here. Should I like it? I don't like it, but you know, something's happening. And so I should just go along with it. And so having clarity of language and knowing, is this something that someone is asking of me, they want something from me, or they want to give something to me as a gift? Yeah, because like, so in that example, the person came to me and said, can I give you a hug? And I was like, oh, that's going to feel nice. But then I realized maybe after a minute that maybe the hug was not for me. Maybe mm -hmm. they wanted that hug. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and that's probably when my body started to get a little shaky, a little like, oh, or maybe they saw I was not well and they assume I wanted a hug, which might be even worse because maybe I didn't want to be touched. And I was like, oh, I don't want to, you know, pain them or to say no, because nobody should say no to a hug. And then the person started hugging me. And then I don't know anymore who is it for. I don't know when, what I should say. And it's just a hug, you know, mm -hmm. very simple things that we probably do every day with so many people without thinking about it. Yeah. So using that example of a hug, hug this is a great, this is a great one to break it down into this question of who's it for. So either I want a hug for myself or I might see that you look upset or sad and, and I want to comfort you in some way. And so I can offer you a hug. So either I want a hug for myself or it's for you. And so to make it more clear in our request or in our offer, 
is to notice our language. And mm -hmm. if it's for me, if I want to hug you, then the clear thing to say would be, may I hug you? Not may I give you a hug because the giving implies I'm doing it for you, but mm -hmm. may I hug you? Or what about, I want a hug, could you hug me? Yeah, so it might be, we want the other one to hug us. So I could say, I, I need a hug or I want a hug, will you hug me? Hmm. So in both cases, it's clear it's for me. Either I'm asking to come and put my arms around you because that would feel good to me, or I'm asking you to come and put your arms around me because that would feel good to me. Hmm. So may I hug you or will you hug me? Those are both clear, it's for me. If I want to offer a hug, then I would say, would you like a hug? Hmm. Would that feel good to you? I see that. Or, I see. or do you want to put your arms around me? <laughs> so, you so know, it, it's funny when you, when you say that because we get into this territory, which was new to me when I started to study the will of consent and working with you and other people, is that it's really vulnerable to do that. Like it's much easier for me to come say, hey, can I hug you, you know, or can I just hug you if I want a hug instead of saying, you know what, I need a hug. Could you hug me? There's, mm -hmm. there's more vulnerability there uh, to really showing myself with my, with my needs. And I guess that's where, I mean, when you say your work is at the intersection of mindfulness, so I guess, where am I? What do I want? Consent here, embodiment really staying in the body and, and sexuality, you know, we could consider a hug, some kind of sexual touch. I mean, it could be with a lover in the bed, you know, to hug uh, with naked bodies, uh, but it's pretty intimate, you know, it's two bodies touching mm -hmm. with each other. So, but for me, the edge was always like, and that's, I guess, the shadow place of it is like, well, I'm going to get what I want and say, can I give you a hug? I don't have to show myself what I need. I'm going to get the hug, but in fact, I'm tricking the person into giving me a hug for me. I'm not really doing it for them. Mm -hmm. That's pretty shadowy exactly. when we do that. And we do that all the time. <laughs> we do it all the time. And it's, it's because you, you named it. It's because of the vulnerability of putting our desires forward. So mm -hmm. you know, how many of you here were taught that it's okay to go for what I want. It's okay to, to say, hey, this is what I want. Can I have it? Anybody? Or were you taught? Not so many it, hands are hurt. No. <laughs> I don't see many <laughs> hands here. You know, or were you taught, you know, it's better to give than to receive. Hmm. By putting the needs of others first, you're more generous. Mm. It's selfish to go for what you want. Yeah, that, that one is- Do you feel it that way? Is that very much in our culture to, to feel that? What, what is it's, it that we consider- It's very much in our culture. Mm. It's very much in our culture. And, and it's, you know, I've, I've traveled throughout the world teaching about consent. And, and every place I've gone, it's very similar. It, it seems to be a, a universal human experience that we are taught to put what we want aside and, and to, to give to others. And, and the reality is we all need to receive. And if we're all giving, who's on the other side of that receiving that? <laughs> so, you know, we're all taught to give. We're not taught to receive. So then when someone's trying to do something for us, we're pushing it away. Oh, no, I don't need that. Oh, I'm fine. I can take care of myself. So we're not really able to take in the gift that's coming towards us. So we're trying to give. We're repelled when people try to give to us. And, and then who's, who's actually receiving? 
And in order to become generous in our giving, we actually have to first know how to fill ourselves up. And for me, this is a spiritual practice. And it is a practice. It's a lifelong practice. So learning how to slow down and to give ourselves space to feel into what is it that I want or need right now? What would feel good to me? What would feel enriching or nourishing or pleasurable or playful or fun or exciting? And really allowing ourselves to expand into that. And then that and that that's a, a process in and of itself to first pay attention and notice that. And then when we've got it, then there's the vulnerability of actually speaking it. How do I turn my want into a clear request? And that's scary because we're exposing ourselves. We're exposing this soft underbelly that, that not many people get to see. And so we then open ourselves up to the possibility of hearing a no, which so often is, is interpreted as a rejection. And so, so there's the process then of actually speaking it and then there's the next layer to it of actually receiving it, which also feels vulnerable. So then there's the vulnerability of what if actually we get a yes? <laughs> <laughs> and now I get it. And what do I do now? So there are these layers that are each and every one has a vulnerability to it. And so it makes sense that we all go around just offering to do things for others. So it's safer, it's socially acceptable. It's not as scary. Yeah, it looks very altruistic, but in fact, it's a lot of protection of self in mm -hmm. so many ways. So mm -hmm. I'm really a trauma geek, and I know you are too. <laughs> and um, one of the things that fascinated me with this discussion and this work is that the first step, which is recognizing, you know, what do I really want and need in my body, is very often so far below the surface, so hard to reach. Because, like you talk about slowing down, because we go really fast in our lives, we do a lot of things, we're on computers and at work and this and that, you know. I often realize, you know, that I can be half in my days if I didn't do my practice because something happened in the morning and I literally haven't connected to my body. I've been in my running head the whole morning. And on top of the lifestyle, I would say, and, you know, the electronics and the distractions, then there is a trauma where we don't always feel our bodies. It's, it's very hard sometimes to really feel uh when sometime i work with clients or I ask them about you know that kind of question how do they want that touch what does it really need they go blank they mm -hmm. even might feel some fear they might feel scared they might feel very vulnerable because there's this moment of connecting to our bodies where it's kind of numb mm -hmm. or it's kind of vague do i want a hug do I want you to hold my hands? Do I want to speak? Do I want you to make me some tea? I mean, it's that. So could you talk about those layers that kind of for that first step that prevent us to really connecting to what we really want? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and when, when you say trauma, when we talk about trauma, that can feel like it's got to be this, this big, um, you know, single event trauma, something happened to me. And there are many different types of trauma that we experience. So we can experience these single event traumatic experiences like a, a car accident, um, or we can experience developmental trauma that is, is, you know, 
through early childhood development, it's more subtle, but we learn adaptive behaviors um, that might be avoidance, it might be um, you know, clinging, it might be pleasing. Um, there also is um, trauma that we can inherit intergener intergenerationally. Uh, so there are all of these different ways that, that we can experience trauma in our body. And some the, the way that I've been talking about it as well is also experiences of stress. So just looking at the last year that we've all been through, it has been an incredibly stressful experience on our bodies, on our nervous system. And, and so as we start to move into a place of, you know, speaking with, within our current context, you know, as, as things start to open up and we start to re-engage with the world, with life, with each other, and these possibilities for touch, for connection, for physical um, touch become available. How do we move from this place of stress and hypervigilance in our nervous system to actually being available for connection and to even being available to our own desires and noticing what that is. Mm -hmm. And so in order for us to have connection, to have intimacy, to play and be in that space of, of playfulness, we have to first feel safe. And it's not just an intellectual safety, but it's a safety in our nervous system. And so noticing what are the tools that you have that help you to feel safer in your body and safe in your nervous system. And so just like, take a moment and check in with yourself and, and think about what are some of the things that you do that calm you down, that help you to feel more grounded, that help you to feel more connected to the earth, to others, to your own body, to yourself. So I know for me, it is, it's slowing down and bringing attention to my breath. Um, it's moving my body. So I've been in a situation where I've been quite isolated in the last year. And, you know, I couldn't spend a lot of time just in my, my house bubble and not being out in the world. And so going out for a walk being in nature, slowly moving my hips. You know, there are these different things that help me connect back to my body. And so I invite you, if you wanna share in the chat box, like what are some of the things that help you connect to your body or with others? So that, you know, you, we talked about it and when we're preparing it, it's really connected for me to that sense of aliveness. So mm -hmm. how alive I feel in my body. Mm -hmm. You know, when I close my eyes, oh, I'm just sitting on my sofa. Do I feel like a zombie? <laughs> just this head, you know, and not really a, sensa a lot of sensation in my body. Or do I feel richness, juiciness, warmth, and all of that mm -hmm. and yeah because of what you explain of these situations we've been in for over a year now my connection to my body when i slow down i might touch a pound that nervous system that's still a little bit shaky a little bit dysregulated a little bit even unsure about where is it do i feel really safe right now maybe i think i do but when i connect to it maybe i'm not um so how do we connect to this aliveness with our bodies i mean you mentioned some some exercise there is this part of it is there even just self-touch like touching our skin and just having mm -hmm. very gentle contact say oh yeah this is my arms this is mm -hmm. my forearms you know this is my hands mm -hmm. uh, you know things we don't really do in a in a mindful way with our yeah. 
Yeah, and and even before touching your cell, I want to invite you to experiment with a, a different practice. And it is touching an object. So I invite all of you who are watching and listening, grab a small object that you can hold in your hand. So I'm taking a little spoon that I have here. Yeah, I've got my my i my iPod. <laughs> container doesn't matter what it is it can be anything and sitting back in your chair getting really comfortable and bringing your hands into your lap you can even bring a pillow into your lap so you're really comfortable and then using this object to explore sensation on your skin so I'm touching myself with the object. You can, you can move your hand across the object. So feeling the object, feeling the texture of it, noticing the temperature, taking in the shape. Noticing, is it smooth or rough? So seeing how much sensory information you can take in about it. And really slowing down. Letting your hands be curious. So our hands are so used to doing work. We use them to type or text or cook or clean or whatever it is we're doing. And so in this moment, it's just letting them relax and be curious. Or you might hold the object in one hand and then drag it across the other hand and notice how that feels. And explore different parts of your hand. You might notice what is the sensation like on your palm or on your fingertips, maybe even between your fingers. And I notice even just doing this for a moment, I notice taking a deep sigh. Mm. So there's a, a relaxation response in the body. And you know what I'm feeling too is that the sensations are opening now, especially when I slow down. It's way more mm -hmm. sensitive when I go very slow. Mm -hmm. And after now a minute doing it, that it was, yeah, when I started and I went a bit fast. And Yeah. Yeah. So whatever speed you're moving, slow it down by half. And bring all your attention to your skin. Yes, there's definitely a big difference when we do that. Yeah, and I notice I become aware of my feet. <laughs> there's a, a tingling in my feet. So what's happening in my nervous system right now when I do that? Because I'm not with anybody. I'm with my little coffee spoon here. Yeah. That doesn't really have uh, emotions. I mean, maybe she does. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, but there's obviously it's very safe, you know, because yeah. the spoon doesn't say anything. So mm -hmm. is, is what create that safety? Because on, on, I'm walking with that object that is really yeah. safe, basically can't hurt well, me. So, so let me ask you some questions. Do you feel safe right now? Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, I do. And what do you notice in your body? Um, softening of my chest and some warmth in my belly. Mm -hmm. What do you notice about your breath? 
my breath has slowed down. Yeah, I guess there's a slowness to it. And it's kind of a more relaxing Excel. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what this practice invites, and it may be different for everyone, but generally what I have found with this practice is that in, it invites us into the parasympathetic nervous system in a place of safety. So when we feel safe and we drop into our parasympathetic nervous system, it's the place of rest, rejuvenation, relaxation. This is often the place we go to during meditation. It's where our nervous system goes when we sleep. So it's very rejuvenating. And we all need time in this place in our nervous system. Mm. So there's a slowing down of the breath. I noticed, I noticed someone yawning. That's a, a typical like release, letting go. I often have a sigh, like a deep sigh. It's like my system is just, it's like it can let go. It can, it can settle in. So others may be noticing those relaxation responses as well. And, and so it's in this place of, of connecting to our social engagement system. So our ability to communicate, our ability to make connection, the connection to our breath, our heartbeat, and then in this place of, of really slowing down and, and this place of relaxation, it's in this place that we can invite connection and intimacy. Mm. And so for me, this is a practice that's it, it, good for so many things. It's a practice in down regulation of our nervous system. So if you're feeling agitated, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling stressed, all you, can, all you have to do is just take something in your hands and just slowly feel it. And I'm not talking about like having a pen and fidgeting while I'm doing 10 other things. <laughs> no, it's not a distraction. It's, a, it's really a touch meditation. And so it's bringing our attention to the sensation in our skin. And it's allowing ourselves the time and the space to just feel for the sake of feeling without any purpose. You might notice it feels relaxing. You might notice it feels pleasant. It might even feel pleasurable. You might notice tingling in your body. Mm -hmm. You might notice sadness or grief coming up. So when we connect to our sensation, when we connect to our body, we connect to our emotional body. And if we have emotions that we've stored up, that we haven't had the space to express, as soon as we slow down and we start to connect, that emotion can come up. And so if that does happen, invite it, welcome it. Give it the space to feel the grief, the sadness, the anger, the joy, whatever's there. It's a practice in being with ourselves and seeing what's possible from there. And then from this place, you could then move into feeling your own skin. And maybe even going back and forth between feeling an object and then feeling your own skin. And the more you do this, the more you expand your capacity to take in sensation, to take in the sensory information. You might notice that you start to hear even better or you might notice you start to smell things. So as we open up 
touch sensation, there's often an expansion of all of the senses at the same time. And I feel, is that a bridge now? So we, I'm back in my body. I'm definitely feeling some uh, centeredness, I would say, some, some kind of presence that maybe was different than 30 minutes ago. So is that the bridge into then starting to be able to feel and to know what I want? Because now I'm back in mm -hmm. and I'm feeling, well, what I was feeling like literally 30 seconds ago was like, I want my weighted blanket on me right now. <laughs> that's what yeah. I would like. This I love my weighted blanket. I was like, oh, that's what I would need now. But I had no idea of that because it was probably buried yeah. by, you know, being distracted here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so that's a yeah that. so what do this I is this then opens up huh i'm starting to notice like yeah what would feel really good to me right now and so as we start to connect and open up our capacity to feel we open up our connection to our own desires our own wants and needs mm -hmm. And our desires come from within. So nobody can tell you what you want. We often do that to each other. Oh, you should do this. Oh, you should want that. Oh, I think you would really like this. Oh, you should do that. And, and so anytime I hear that word should, that's a red flag for me. It's like, mm, and I, I do it to myself. I should want this. I should do this. And it's like, no, okay, slow down. I should put that aside. What do I want? And connecting to that, it can sometimes take some time. And we have a tendency to be impatient with ourselves. I should know. I should know instantly. I should know exactly what that looks like right now. And we don't always. And I would say particularly, um, and, and you know, people have had such different experiences over this last year, especially when it comes to touch and connection with others. So there have been people who have been completely isolated with no contact with others. There are people who have you know, been living with others, but no touch or contact. There are people who are living with others and that's all they've had touch and contact with and they've had enough of it. Um, you know, there are people who, you know, there are many people in a small space and because they can't freely go out in the world, they're, you know, they're overloaded with, with connection with other people. And so you know, we're all somewhere on this spectrum of the, the connection and touch that we've had in this last year. And so a question I invite each of you to, to think about and sit with is, you know, what has your experience been over this last year when it comes to your, your needs and your desires around touch and connection with others or even with yourself? What has your experience been what have you appreciated about it? What has been really difficult or challenging with that? And, and be noticing, what are you noticing you're longing for right now? And I know for me, like one, so this just popped into my head as I was speaking, like something that sounds really delicious to me is to just be held, to have someone sit behind me and wrap their arms around me and just, you know, where I can rest into, lean into, relax into, and just have someone hold me. Mm. And just like the thought of that is, is touching. Like I can feel the emotion in my body of, oh, yeah, that would feel good. Mm. So we are 
now needed to voice what we need. <laughs> and we, we talked about that earlier. And so does anything come up for you? Um, you know what I was thinking? I wanted, I was like, I need to cook that one recipe. I want to eat that specific food, which is an old recipe from my mother. Mm. I haven't seen my parents in a year and a half because I haven't been able to travel and I miss them dearly. And one of the way I've gone through that was by cooking recipe that I used to eat at home. Mm -hmm. And I didn't pick it up immediately about it. I, I didn't really realize about it. And then it's like, why am I cooking so much of those specific recipes? And I would email my mother and say, can you send me? I'm not sure about that part of the recipe. And she would send it to me. And even if I was eating that dinner or that lunch alone, that was this sense of communion, this sense mm. of connection, this mm -hmm. sense of proximity through other senses. You know, there was no touch, but there was emotions. Oh, yeah. Memories. There was smell. There was eyes. There was taste. You know, so many of my sense were back there. And for me, that beyond just the meal being really good or the food really good, it was nourishing on so many other levels. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I want to point about what you said. Say, well, I should do that. People say, you know what? You should go for walks in the wood. You should, because that feels really good. But I was in a place where I was so exhausted that even that was too much. And in fact, what my body wanted was to rest, to slow mm -hmm. down. I didn't want to go for long hikes. But the should in my mind, that was this voice about what I should do and what should feel good. And I really struggled with that, realizing, you know, because for me, resting and slowing down is so rare. I don't give that to myself. And I'm really harsh on myself on that because I do too many things, I guess. But there is that thing about, oh, if I just rest and do nothing today, I'm, I'm lazy. Or I'm this and that, you know, so I could see many layers coming up. Mm -hmm. And it was vulnerable just with myself to allow feeling my own needs and giving it to myself. I'm not even talking about asking you, Robin, for a hug or <laughs> cooking a nice recipe to me, like just with myself. Yeah. And I was like, oh my goodness, how hard it is then when we need to ask something very vulnerable to someone. You know what? Mm -hmm. I really like what's going on right now, but I need it a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I want you to do that a little bit different. And I feel, you know, and I won't kind of move on to that because that's where the yes and the no's are also. Sometimes... Mm -hmm. Because when I sort of trauma, like you said, it's so many ways, but we often think, oh, yeah, I could have been abused or things like that. But we don't often think of our relationship with maybe with our primary partner. And we're doing lovemaking, for example, and it's going well, but we want something maybe slightly different, but the person seems to really enjoy it. And we just let them go on with it because we don't want to hurt them and we're afraid to be seen and then I guess what happened I mean for me what I've witnessed practicing that for many years is that then my body shut down mm. then I I feel less you know I'm, I'm less I might be still present but it's harder for me to connect to my desires then okay. so how do we navigate that space of the yes and the no's of the body? You know, when we are on those, yeah, it's not about someone in the street that asked me for a hug and I'm like, no, thank you. I'm talking at the intimate space. The space doesn't have to be physical intimacy, but even emotional intimacy, where we have a connection maybe with someone, but there's so much untapped potential and we know that, but we are just there basically. And we kind of stay there because we're used to it. Or it's mm -hmm. just the way it's been. Yeah. Great question. And as we segue there, I just want to invite, um, invite people to share in the chat box. If there's something that you connected with, there's something that you want. Um, 
that you've connected with from what we've covered so far. I invite you to, if it feels uh, comfortable to share that um, in the chat box, like what are you starting to connect with around your desires and what you want? And maybe we can use some of that as, um, as examples as we move into connecting with our yes and no. Mm -hmm. And so no is such an interesting word. <laughs> and how many people like hearing a no? I don't see any hands. <laughs> How many people have a hard time saying no? I see lots of hands. A lot of hands up. So even the words yes and no carry a lot of meaning and weight. So just by saying the word yes, and I invite you just for a moment to just like bring into your awareness the word yes. And notice how a yes feels in your body. So you might just close your eyes. You might repeat yes in your mind. You might even say it out loud. You're all muted. You might just say yes a few times and notice what that feels like in your body. Mm. And what do you notice? It's like my body is smiling. That's what I saw. Like a big mm. smile, like, a, mm. uh, like, yes, yes, yes. You know, like this. Yeah, mm -hmm. like a big smile. Mm -hmm. My body is smiling. I love that. Um, yeah, and there's a comment here. Safe, relief, happy, smile, body relaxes and expands. So without even talking about anything, just the word yes, there's this bodily experience that's happening. And then let's take a moment with the word no. So I invite you to call a no into your awareness. And you might just repeat it silently in your head. You might say it out loud. You might move your body in some way. But just noticing a no. Mm. What is that like? Well, I definitely felt my body curling in like a shell. And I feel the first thing that came for me was sadness. Mm. Definitely something sad. And then there was anger mixed mm. with sadness. So, but there was definitely this like, almost maybe me, young, crying, young part of me. Like a, I could see myself younger there. Yeah. Mm, a lot came up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no apology. What should I do, doctor? <laughs> <laughs> notice. Just notice. So we also have a slumping in my body, sadness, loss, closed off, heaviness. No is scary and angry, bracing, fear, shutdown, sad, contraction, recoil. It lands like a thud, like there's no movement kind of restriction. No was a drag, heavy. So just in a moment of connecting with the word no, again, there's a very visceral body experience of no. 
And how much time do we take to listen to our body? When we're doing something, when someone asks something of us, when we're engaging with someone, you know, I can speak for myself. I don't really take a lot of time to tune in and notice what's my body doing right now. And our body is giving us a lot of information all the time, particularly around what it wants and what it doesn't want. And so as we begin to, and this can be a practice solo in our own space of noticing what is it that I want? Or as we're moving toward something, as we're doing something, to just take a moment to pause and notice. Is my body a yes to this or is it a no to this? And allowing for, for that space for our body to speak. And then when we're engaging with another, taking the time and the space to check in. Am I, is my body a yes to this? Is my body feeling open, expansive? Or is my body contracting, restriction, shutting down, pulling away? So we can slow down and we can start to pay attention to this information that's coming. And so this is why when I talk about consent being embodied, that it's not just a mental, I'm a yes, I'm a no, we have an agreement, but it's really allowing our whole being to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Because our body's talking to us. It's giving us that information. Yeah, and I feel we are overriding that most of the time uh, because we don't slow down, because we are not embodied. <laughs> we are mm -hmm. you know, head a lot. Uh, but I want to touch about this yes-no experience because it was quite fascinating to do it. Is it going to be really harder than to give the no's because they feel somehow that, um, I mean, we talk about nothing. We just felt the yes, felt the no. There was no question asked. I didn't connect to any specific experience. And yet there is a charge. There's an emotional mm -hmm. charge that's very present there. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it looks like the no, you know, is definitely heavy. You know, there's something hard there. And yet for me to reclaim my power, to be able to really step in to the world with my clear yeses, but even also my clear no's, I can, do I need to discharge this no? Can I really explore what is there? Because I saw myself young and sad and so there's attachment to that. There is probably no that I receive. You know, my parents told me, no, you can't do that. Oh, no, you can't have your dessert. You need to finish the, this first. Because if not, I'm never going to be able to really allow my no's. I'm mm -hmm. Just even to feel that. I'm not even talking about speaking them, but even feeling them. Because my body's like, I don't want to feel that. This is not mm -hmm. nice. So how do we, and it's a little bit, yes, what um, our friend is asking here is how do we prevent ourselves from overriding that, what I'm yeah. feeling, and, yeah. and then voice it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is such an important question, and it goes back to our socialization. So the same things that we were taught about it's better to give than to receive put other people's needs forward. So how many of us were taught that saying no is welcome and is a good thing? <laughs> we were not taught. And if you look back to children at the age of two, when they start to 
build an awareness of their body autonomy. How often does a two-year-old say no? A lot. <laughs> and what do we call that? The terrible twos. So we are taught that when we connect to a no, that it's terrible. That when we actually speak up for our limits, that we're no longer a nice person. And we have this value around being nice, which leads to a lot of us not being honest. And so part of, of <laughs> in my perspective, it's part of our re-education mm -hmm. um, is, is shedding these ideas that we were taught and relearning a sense of body autonomy and learning that we can still have connection and say no. We can have limits and still be loved. So as humans, we are wired for connection. And oftentimes the fear behind a no is the fear of rejection and it's the fear of losing connection, which at our core, we all want and need. We want to belong. We want to be part of the group. And our body is wired for that. And so that's part of what makes it so hard to say a no. You know, we don't want to be the one to reject others and to hear a no. And the truth is that as these autonomous individuals, we all have desires, we all have needs for what we want. And we all have limits, limits to what we are willing to give to another, what we're able to give to another. We have limits on our time. We have limits on our resources. We have limits on our energy. And when we aren't able to say no as a form of self-care, we can override our own limits and very quickly go into a place of overgiving, burnout, resentment, um, sickness. Mm -hmm. So what I would love to do is reframe a no. And that my no is not a rejection of you. When I say no to you, I'm actually saying yes to myself. And when I can say no, I'm letting you know that I can take care of myself and I can speak up for my limits. And so when I say yes, you can trust my yes. You can trust that I actually have the capacity to give you what I'm offering without it turning to resentment or I did this for you. And so what are you going to do for me? And so this goes back to the importance, the importance of being able to receive and fill ourselves up and the importance of knowing what our limits are, what we are truly, generously able and willing to do in any given moment for the benefit of another. And if we can't speak up for that, then we can't truly give to another without an agenda to get something for ourselves. I feel that so clearly. And I had this personal experience, you know, we talked a few months ago <laughs> where I was sharing with you. Um, I went through a few months where I needed so much rest. And basically, um, you know, I'm a giver. 
I don't even know what that means anymore, but I was like, you know, I'm really out there and giving a lot. But I went to that unknown place in my life where it was no for everything, everything, everyone. My body was in such need of rest. My defense, my, my boundaries were so visible that it was a yes to myself. I needed just to take care of myself, you know, and it went for a while. It went from, you know, a few months mm -hmm. and I kind of spiraled down into that because it's uncomfortable to say no to everybody and everything. I got friends that got really upset, you know, the friend that came here and wanted to give me a hug. And I say, you know, I don't want to be touched. I don't want to hug. And the person took it in the, you know, got very upset that I didn't like them. Because, you know, we have this cultural conditioning that <laughs> somehow it's about you, but it had nothing to do with that person. It would have been anybody else there. I would have said the same. But I stayed strong in it. And I spiraled even more down into it until big, big nose. And then I got to that breakthrough. And that's why I want to talk about it, where there was one final yes that I was giving that, in fact, was for my body or no. You know, it was a contact with someone that I had to break down. I had to stop. And when I did that, I called that person and said, hey, I just, I'm going to stop having any contact here. I, I know that I can't allow that. Within a few hours, I got out of my two months of sparring down mm -hmm. and being exhausted. And everything shifted in my life. Not that this was the only reason, you know, there was many things that I'd slowed down and I had to take care of myself. But I finally, I think it was the first time, and, you know, I've been practicing the wheel for three years now. It was the first time that I felt the power of my no that allowed me to see myself. This is me. And it's okay. You know, like I was really okay with it. But it was a messy, heavy process. Hmm. Hmm. And so empowering. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I want to address this question about how to prevent yourself from overriding what you know your body is telling you that you need. And then I want to talk about some ways to play with a no. So, so the first step in, in preventing ourselves from overriding whatever's happening is to slow down. And I can't say this enough. And so in whatever way you can create some space for yourself, and it might help to name it. So if someone asks something of you, you might say, you know what? I need just a few minutes to sit with your request. So you're buying yourself some time and you're letting them know, I need some time to check in with myself. And you might even say that as well. You know what? I need a few minutes to check in with myself and see if I'm available for that. So, and, and finding your own words about that. How can you let someone know that you're gonna take some space before you give a response? So you're letting them know and you're also letting yourself know. It's a self reminder. Okay, slow down here. We don't have to jump and respond immediately. We can take a few deep breaths and then notice like what helps you to be present with yourself. Is that a few breaths? Is that noticing your feet on the floor? Is that standing up and moving around? So giving yourself some space, taking some breath, taking up some space, and then checking in. How do I feel about this request? And notice your level of willingness. 
So yes and no is not binary. We're not either 100% yes and 100% no. We're somewhere along this spectrum. So notice if you are right up there, like I am a hell yes to that. I'm totally willing and available. Or it might be, mm, I'm not really sure. And if you're not sure, notice, do you need more information? Or do you need more time to get clear? So kind of feeling into, one of the things I notice really helps me get more clear about whether I'm a yes or a no. And you, we touched on this with the very first example of the hug, how you were a yes to the hug, but then it went on for a while and then you notice getting uncomfortable and it was still happening. And then it was like, oh, I don't wanna be here anymore. So the time factor is one that helps me get really clear. If it is just a general request and I have no idea how long this is gonna go on for, I'm way over in that, I'm not really sure, I'm, I'm pretty close to a no. And then if someone says, you know, I'd like this for five minutes or 10 minutes or an hour, then it's like, oh, okay, that gives me, uh, that gives me some context to work with. Well, I know I'm definitely not a yes to two hours, but I feel pretty good about 10 minutes and five minutes, hell yeah, I can do that for five minutes. So noticing like what information do you need about the time? How long is this gonna go on for? And so those are all things that can help you to slow down and notice and not override those automatic behaviors of I'm just a yes to everything or I'm a no to everything. It gives more space to tune in and, and check in with yourself in this moment with this request, with this person, for this amount of time, how does that feel for you? Is that when we touch the divine, when we slow down a lot? Is that where it is in a very moment? Like I can finally touch it inside of me? But yeah. We call it truth, we can call it so many things, but... It's a moment of presence. It's a moment of stillness. It's a moment of, it doesn't have to be anything other than what it is right now. Hmm. So now I can voice it. I found it inside myself. I've, you know, past all those layers. And then my throat gets tight. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there's like this. And then I say something which is a lie, you know, or an half truth. Mm. I say, yes, I'm okay, you know, uh, with it. And, uh, but I feel in my body because I'm in maybe space, maybe, or I mean, a yes for a person say, can I talk for an hour? And I felt like a yes, 30 minutes, but I'm like, you know what? They want an hour. I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to do it. So I basically either speak a lie or I don't really speak it. I just don't say anything and I just go with it. Is that, I mean, I know it's common. <laughs> Very common. You know, we do that a lot at work with our partners in life, with the world, you know? Mm -hmm. So my, my favorite interjection is, can we pause? Can we just take a moment? I need to check in with myself. I'm noticing I'm not feeling as available anymore. Or I'm noticing I'm full. Or I'm noticing I am starting to feel distracted and I'm not fully present with you. 
So it's, it's outing ourselves. It's being transparent. This is where I'm at in this moment. And we need to renegotiate. I've actually realized that's as much as I can give. Mm. And that can feel, that can feel very vulnerable. And it comes back to, am I, am I pushing this person away? Am I severing the connection? And the truth is, there is so much connection in vulnerability. There is so much connection in truth. There is connection in being able to speak up when we're no longer available. Hmm. And that can feel just as, if not more vulnerable than asking for what we want in the first place. Mm. It's like now we've gotten to doing this thing together, whether that's touching or listening or cooking together, you know, whatever it is, like we've gone through that process of negotiation and we're, you know, we're in it. And now something's changed. I feel different. And what, what risk is there? in speaking up and saying something in this moment. Mm. And it's a practice as with everything we've talked about. Where are those places? Who are those people that we can practice with? Mm. And I find it really helpful to have a conversation up front and share. You know, maybe you're you have a partner and you say, you know, I'm going to really practice speaking up and saying no. And so I just want to forewarn you, like, I might be saying <laughs> no more. And, and this is for me to really stay connected to myself so that I'm more available to you. And it, it has nothing to do with you. So you might preface it with that. So then you, it's like giving yourself permission to say no more. You might make a game out of it or a joke, like, um, you know, look out, I'm gonna be practicing my no. And, and maybe you say no as your first response to everything. Maybe you say like, I'm gonna first say no, and then I'm gonna see if that changes into a yes, just as a practice. And so finding those places where you can step into and feel safe being able to expose yourself a little bit more. Or it might be having an agreement, like, you know, maybe you have a date night and for that time together, you're gonna, you're gonna pause and check in with each other and have some reflection time on what you're noticing. And then you might, you know, have some physical intimacy and then you might take a pause again and check in. Like you can frame interactions and say, okay, this is a practice space. And this is something that, that I'm curious about and I'm exploring and I wanna try it out. And that framing can help to open up a little more space so it's not coming out of the blue. I really like that. Um, I mean, it's indeed, you know, I think really powerful to be able to do that with someone that I've learned those techniques and went through it. And, you know, obviously if you're interested you can dive much more in that and you know contact robin for that because this this is just a, a little taste <laughs> of what's in it but yeah one of the questions i have for you robin and is like well okay now i'm starting getting some information is good here i won't start practicing that and then i return to the world that has no boundary that is taking a lot from me without permission 
and where nose is not okay. And I'm going to be looked a little bit as a person that's a little bit maybe weird or a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to separate from the world even because the world might reject me with all my agreements and consent desires and <laughs> true speaking. So how do we do that in a container that's beyond the, the, the space here or beyond, you know, just with our partners that maybe have trained with it, with people that are total strangers, could be our boss, could be someone, you know, in the line or at the supermarket, really everybody out there that uh, has all the things that we talked about earlier about the no and the yes and the shame and the fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a couple things. So the first is, you know, if you imagine, uh, <laughs> if I imagine going into the gym right now, I haven't been in a gym in I don't know how many years. And I decide I'm going to go start lifting some weights. I'm not going to go directly to the 50 pound weights and, and be able to, to lift those weights. I might start with 10 and maybe five <laughs> and see how that feels. And I'm going to do that for a little while. And then I'm going to go to 10 and then maybe 20 and then maybe 25. And I might stay there for a while. So I'm building this muscle. It's the same thing. As we build our muscles around speaking up and asking for what we want. And as we build our muscles around saying no, it takes time to build our capacity to do that. And so start where it feels safe. I wouldn't say go out and, and do this in every conversation, in every relationship. It's overwhelming. You'll exhaust yourself. <laughs> and, and then you'll just give up and say, no, this doesn't work. She was all wrong. I don't know what she was talking about. This is stupid. So, so start in those places, in those relationships where you can practice, where you can build those skills. And then you might expand that circle. So you might start with an intimate partner. And, and then as you get more comfortable and that feels good, you're able to speak up more, you might that extend that to your, your family. I, this may be too much for some. This may be like way out there. Um, but noticing like 100 pounds weight. <laughs> yeah. So where's that next level? Maybe your your chosen family, the you know, close friends, people in your life. Um, you know, reaching out to a friend, hey, I want to, I want to practice speaking up for what I want and and, and saying no to what I don't want. Are, is that something that interests you? Do you wanna do you practice that in our relationship? And, and so like gradually expanding your circle outward. And then I guarantee you will start to notice in other areas of your life without having to effort or try that how you relate with the world will start to shift. You'll become more aware of those relationships and those places where it's not clear. And in those places, you can invite more clarity. You know, it sounds like there's something you want from me, but I'm not really clear. What is it? Or, you might notice, you know, you're saying yes, but your body's telling me that you're not really a yes. And I invite you to just take some time to check in and see if you're really a yes to this or, or if it's a no. And if it's a no, I'm totally good with that. So rather than having to educate people, you model it. You embody it for yourself and then you model it in the relationships in your life. And it will start to trickle out and you'll see 
You'll see the relationships where it's not clear. Um, that might be on an interpersonal level, that might be on a systemic level. Mm. And you'll start to notice something within yourself that you are becoming more clear, that you're desiring more clarity from others and you can invite that. So that's, that's my approach I love and that. recommendation. I love that. And I just want to put it out there because when I started many years ago doing that work, I thought I was very clear on many things around that. And I was clear on my yes and my no's. And when I started diving into that work after a few weeks, I realized it was a complete mess. <laughs> so just putting it out there, you know, I was like, oh, wow. Wow. I feel I was navigating in the shadow of all of it. Like I was not already clear because I didn't already feel my body because there was unprocessed trauma. There was many things that made me afraid to say no. There was a lot of yes that were no's or there was a lot of maybe that were no's, you know, but it was always yes. And so I, it, got, it got, it didn't got confusing. I was just really amazed how I opened my eyes into the absence of consent in most of my interaction with people. And then I saw why, yes, oh yes. Somehow I was abused and I was a victim and now I'm kind of okay with that. I'm, I've just gave up, I, my boundary were crossed. So I just abandoned myself in the process because that's really how I felt. I was like, I'm completely abandoning myself in that so that's really vulnerable usually when we start doing that work so mm -hmm. we are we are almost at the end here so i don't know if there is one last advice or something that's really like oh, i really wanted to talk about that robin uh it's been really wonderful but maybe there is something you want to conclude with um and i'm going to leave you with the last words like i do every time so I, I want to just thank everybody here and for your time and really invite you to look at Robin's uh, website that will be under this video or on the podcast or here in the chat. And I want to thank you so much, Robin, for this conversation. But yeah, last, last point, last things you want to share and I'll let you, I'll let you close this. So. Mm, thank you. Well, and, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And, and I want to say thank you to all of you for your presence here and your, your comments and, um, and feedback. And I think the, the last thing I would say is to be gentle and to be kind with yourself. This is really, it's like learning a new language. We're learning the language of the body and the language of consent. And, and <laughs> just like everything else, it's a practice, it's a process of slowing down and noticing and being with ourselves and being with the discomfort that arises in learning something new. Um, if any of you are like me, like when I learn something new, I want to be an expert instantly. I don't want to go through the process of, of getting it wrong and messing up and saying something the wrong way or hurting someone's feelings. And it's part of the process. So be kind, be compassionate, and give yourself a break as you learn this new language and practice this new language. Um, and, and what I have found in my own exploration with this is that it is so worth the investment. It is so worth the journey um, to come to this place of more clarity and actually more authentic connection that is possible um, when we begin to practice this body and full body language of consent. So thank you all. It has been a real pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. See you all very soon.